Hi, everyone. This is Leslie Law, the producer and director of Sandbox Radio. Thanks so much for downloading the podcast. This episode, Fools Rush In, was made possible in part by the Seattle Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs and the generous contributions of our audience members and listeners like you. Help us create future episodes by making a tax-deductible donation online at thesandboxac.org. Tonight's episode features special guests soprano Megan Chenevik, Susan Corzat, Nancy Pearl, and Cliff Mass. And now, Fools Rush In. Sandbox Radio We'll stay all day In the backyard we'll play Jump into our sandbox We sell castles and kings Words become things of Lenin in Fremont, the center of the universe. In tonight's episode, new plays from Emily Convey, John Longenbaum, and Wayne Raleigh. A fresh new episode of Markheim by Paul Mullen. The latest adventures of Cousin Katie from Scott Augustson. Richard Zyman and the company bring you the love song of J. Alfred Dufrock. Susan Corzat reads Dorothy Parker. Special guest soprano Megan Chenevik and music from the Sandbox Radio Orchestra led by Jose Juicy Gonzalez. <laughs> says so right on the sign outside. All the world's a book bookstore. Oh, so that's what that means. Well, that's a relief. You would not believe the places that people will tell you are bookstores that aren't bookstores. Really? Really. I've been walking around this town all day going from place to place that people told me are bookstores that aren't. Like? Like libraries and drug stores and thrift stores. Oh. Well, they all have books. And fire stations, and a vacant lot, and a bowling alley. Those seem less likely. Everyone keeps sending me someplace else. Most people don't seem to know what a book is anymore. You may be right. Well, I have plenty of books. You do. Thank goodness for that. I've got a whole list of books that I'm looking for. Great. Do you want to give that to me? This? Okay. Send the Galk another mile. Is this the book you're looking for? No, it's just a piece of paper someone gave me a while back. All right then, what book are you looking for? Do you have a copy of Why Fish Don't Like You by Barry M. Filch? <laughs> I don't believe so, no. How about How to Milk a Pigeon by Charlie Sag? Sorry, no. 60 Different Ways to Sit on a Fence by Dr. Ashbury Downs? Don't know that one. The Life of Eve's Mother by Anonymous. No. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Intimate Thoughts of Rocks by Freddie Bunt. I don't think so. The Many Virtues of Pigeon Milk by Sylvia Plith. No. <laughs> What's with Yellow Anyway by Amanda Polychrome. <laughs> Sorry, no. 
Let's make a banana, edited by E. Mountain. No. <laughs> Either uh, Ten Ways to Tell You're Dead, or Let's Wait for You, More Fat for Me, both by Dr. Cecil Tweep. Neither of those. Uh, favorite songs of deaf people? Deaf people? Yes? No. Hand Over That Stoat, You Scoundrel, by Eugene O'Neill. Oh, the playwright. I don't think he wrote plays. Well, that was his cousin. Then no. Uh, the Idiot's Guide to Idiots, published by Hope Mifflin. Not that one, no. I Can Conjure conji You by Dee Nesselthorpe? No. Understanding Umlauts by Lars Ugelforsson? No. Uh, Feathers in Farmyards, My Life as a Pigeon Dairyman by Victor Messy? No. Either uh, Norman the Gnostic Gnome or Charlie and the Liver Onions Factory, they're, they're for children. No and no. Bessie, the pigeon who wouldn't give milk, also for children? What is with all these books about pigeon milk? It's very good for you. No. Lose weight through gargling? Dongles and the men who make them? If it's Tuesday, this must be Friday? Flora and Fauna of Moo? No, I have none of those books. I have never heard of any of those books. Oh, then why are they on my list? I don't think your dog likes me. He likes everybody. He's eyeing my pants leg. Does that mean anything? Mr. Uh... Just call me Gerald. Gerald, I have been selling books for a long time. My shop has an extensive inventory, so I'm surprised I've never heard of a single title from your list. Oh. May I ask why you're looking for these books in particular? Well, Miss... Oh, you can call me Sybil. Sybil. I, I have a lot of smart friends. In, in fact, all my friends are smarter than me. Uh, they're so well-informed on so many different subjects, and I'm not. In fact, I think I'm, I'm probably an idiot. So every time they talk about something that I don't understand, I ask them where they heard about it, and they give me book titles. But sadly, I've had no luck finding any of these books. Gerald, I don't think any of these books exist. Uh, he's got my pants leg. He doesn't bite. He just bit my pants leg. Ignore the dog. Gerald, do you know what a gawk is? No. Quite a grip on that little guy. It's you. You are the gout. Oh, he, he seems to be pulling me toward the door. Your friend sent you on a useless errand, and you have been wasting my time. Are you sure he doesn't bite? If you stay, he might. There's one more book on my list. What is it? The Secret Sacred Heart of the World. <gasps> Erasmus! What's the title again? The Secret Sacred Heart of the World. I don't know the author. Erasmus, Come. <laughs> Yes, I do have that book, Gerald. You do? Yes. Oh, that's great. It's in the special collection. <gasps> Where's that? Down here. <laughs> Down there? Yes, in the special collection. It, it, it's awfully dark down there. It is. Here. Take this candle. You want me to go? Yes. But what if I catch something on fire? Take the dog. He'll make sure you don't bump into anything. He doesn't like me. He'll go with you. Uh, how do I get down there? It's not far. You can use the ladder, but I'd recommend you just jump. Hello? You sure it's not too far down? I'm sure. Okay, here I go. Ready, doggy? He really doesn't like me. Just don't look him directly in the eyes and you'll be fine. Okay, I'll just pick him up like this then. Cautiously. Cautiously. And a one, and a two. Do you take Diners Club? No. Oh, well that's all I have. We'll work out payment later. And a one, and a two, and a three! I'm okay. How's the dog? Should I follow him? He'll follow you. He's your dog now. Any idea where I should start looking? If it's a good book, and you really want to read it, you won't have to look too far. It'll find you. Okay, then. Off we go. Let's see. Oh, world history. I always wanted to know some of that. Oh, and what are the ones with the green and gold bindings? I wonder if this time I should get a cat. May I help you? I'm looking for a book by a certain author. Yes? 
Tom Clancy? <laughs> Never heard of him. The following message is brought to you by ASTEP.org. Hey, Chanel! Chanel! You busy right now? Uh, I'm eating lunch, dude. Ah, wow, that you are. Stay right there. We'll come to you. We'll? <whistles> Lupe! Lupe! Here, girl. Come on. That's right. That's a girl. Dude, what the hell? What are you doing with an ox in the cafeteria? And what's all that stuff on its back? Check it, Chanel. It's my interdisciplinary 3D response to the top exports of Ecuador. The top exports of... Well, see the banana tree and the bucket of oil? And how I strung those shrimp across Lupe's back as a sort of ironic convergence between the two? Uh... I'm still not getting it. It's my traveling artistic statement, man. I heard you guys are starting an A-step chapter on campus. Artists striving to end poverty. And I'm ready to be your first volunteer. But aren't you like an econ major? Well, totally. See, performance art is my fallback plan. <laughs> Dude. ASEP sends volunteer artists out to work with schools and partner organizations in the U.S. and places all over the world, like Bangalore, India, and Quito, Ecuador. Yeah, Quito! I did the research. That's why I rented Lupe. <laughs> but we place artists in specific communities to help address the risks that young people face today, including substance abuse, gender inequality, HIV AIDS, domestic violence, gang violence, and teen pregnancy. Exactly! Sign me up! Look, I hate to say this, dude, but we're looking for serious professional artists and students and faculty from schools like Juilliard, USC, and Cornish. And we draw from a variety of artistic mediums, such as drama, dance, visual art, music, and creative writing. Whoa, whoa, wait. Are you saying I'm not serious? Well, have you had any arts training? No. Hey, dude, what's going on with your cow, man? But that doesn't, that doesn't mean my soul isn't screaming out to express itself. Oh, my God. Dude, it's doing a number in the cafeteria. What? <laughs> Oh, Lupe! Stop! No pooping! Oh. Serious odorama, man. Um, the lunch staff's calling the cops. <sighs> Sorry, dude. But if you'd like to help, ASAP can always use a nice donation. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chanel. I'll put that in my pipe or whatever. Here, take a banana. I better mosey. Are you a working artist or studying to be one? want to have a real impact on the world, visit astep.org today and learn more about our unique volunteer opportunities and how to start an ASTEP chapter on your campus. That's Artists Striving to End Poverty online at A-S-T-E-P dot O-R-E. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome to the microphone, Susan Corzat. Inscription for the ceiling of a bedroom. Daily dawns another day, I must up to make my way. Though I dress and drink and eat, move my fingers and my feet, Learn a little here and there. Weep and laugh and sweat and swear. Hear a song or watch a stage. Leave some words upon a page. Claim a foe or hail a friend. Bed awaits me at the end. Though I go in pride and strength, I'll come back to bed at length. Though I walk in blinded woe, back to bed I'm bound to go. High my heart or bowed my head. All my days but lead to bed and out and on and then 
ever back to bed again. Summer, winter, spring, and fall. I'm a fool to rise at all. <laughs> Unfortunate coincidence. By the time you swear you're his, shivering and sighing, and he vows his passion is infinite, undying. Lady, make a note of this. One of you is lying. <laughs> Ninon de Longclaw on her last birthday. So let me have the rouge again and comb my hair the curly way. The poor young men, the dear young men, they'll all be here by noon today. And I'll shall wear the blue, I think. They beg to touch its rippled lace. Oh, do they love me best in pink? So sweetly flattering the face. And are you sure my eyes are bright? And is it true my cheek is clear? Young what's-his-name stayed half the night. He vows to cut his throat, poor dear. So, bring my scarlet slippers then and fetch the powder puff to me. The dear young men, the poor young men, they think I'm only 70. <laughs> Pictures in the smoke. Oh, gallant was the first love, and glittering and fine. The second love was water in a clear white cup. The third love was his, and the fourth was mine. And after that, I always get them all mixed up. <laughs> Afternoon. When I am old and comforted, and done with this desire, with memory to share my bed, peace to share my fire, I'll comb my hair in scalloped bands beneath my laundered cap, watch my cool and fragile hands lie light upon my lap. And I will have a sprigged gown with lace to kiss my throat. I'll draw my curtain to the town and hum a purring note. And I'll forget the way of tears and rock and stir my tea. But oh, I wish those blessed years were further than they be. on a beautiful Seattle morning? Perfect. Knockity-knock, neighbor. Oh, good morning, Marco. Lena, I need your waffle iron and a papaya. Well, help yourself. <laughs> so who's the lucky guy getting breakfast? Well, I slept with this cop to get out of a parking ticket, and now I don't want to break up. Are you falling for him? No, I've got an outstanding bench warrant. <laughs> Hey, is she up yet? Who? You know who. Oh, you mean my cousin Katie from Ketchikan? My cousin Katie from Ketchikan. Who else? Well, she seemed a little down yesterday, so I'm letting her sleep in. Katie, down? I gotta go to work. Uh, can you just stay and check on her? Ooh, my pleasure. Oh, and the cop? Habeas corpus. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> Hey, Marco. <laughs> Katie, 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 how are you? Well, Marco, 
to tell you the truth, I'm a little overwhelmed. I love Seattle, but compared to Ketchikan... Uh-huh. I mean, I keep hearing about the Seattle freeze. <laughs> but excuse my language, that's a load of baloney. I mean, yesterday I was sitting reading a paperback book. <laughs> Hey, I see you're reading a paperback book. <laughs> I am. You know, if you're looking for a science fiction classic, you ought to try A Crack in the Moon. It's all about the adventures of a plumber in space. <laughs> you don't say. Oh, and if you want to read about twin sisters who open a cat grooming shop in Edwardian England, try the Pussy Brushers of Bristol. I'll remember that one. If you want a bittersweet tale of the bond between a blind sheepdog and a parrot, check out Fur and Feathers, Friends Forever. I do like animals. If you're looking for an illustrated textbook on tropical skin diseases... Oh, I, I'm not. <laughs> well, speaking of young adult novels... Lady, you sure know a lot about books. Nancy Pearl, librarian of the people. Seattle's book maven, action figure sold separately. <laughs> your first library, Katie. I bet you have fond memories. Oh, I do. It was in the county building, two doors down from the STD clinic. <laughs> hey, just because I'm a librarian, don't get the wrong idea. We aren't a bunch of dowdy, shushing spinsters. Oh, I know. Back in Ketchikan, our librarian, Fran, is in the Federal Witness Protection Program. <laughs> She ran over her ex with a lacar, but she got sprung for squealing on Squinty Figgins. You don't mess with Fran, and you bring your books back on time. <laughs> Fran's motto? I don't do overdo. Catch a can. If you're looking for a book on the gold rush... Oh, Marco, she went on and on. Oh, I am so sorry. She was nice, but it was exhausting. And everywhere I go, I run into somebody like that. I'm almost worn out. Katie, honey, little secret, some days I myself get depleted and all the clinique in the world won't touch these bags. Oh, Marco. Because, believe it or not, I have known some disappointment. Oh, Marco, I never would have guessed that about you. Some days I am all set to give my heart to someone, and what do they say in return? They say I'm squirrely or high maintenance or all over the map. What does that even mean, all over the map? <laughs> Once in Ketchikan, there was a misprint on this map because the town cartographer, Sminty LaRue, he took to drink in the sterno, and his hands, his hands got shaky and straight lines went squiggly. Well, a dozen snowshoeing Shriners from Sheboygan almost met an untimely death, shivering in their snow shelters because of Sminty's shakes. <laughs> Fortunately... Anyway, Katie, my point is that when you need a recharge... Oh. When, you, when you need a recharge, you go to your thinking spot. Ah. Oh. And in Seattle, there's no better thinking spot than Lincoln Park. It's a quiet place to recenter. That sounds like what I need. How do I get to this Lincoln Park? Just take the hilariously named Rapid Ride. <laughs> Thank you, bus driver. Oh, Marco was right. This place is swell. It's beautiful and everyone seems to be content to just be by themselves. Even that bald eagle looks pensive. Oh, 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 oh. Whoa. Ow. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to trip on you. I didn't see you. I was looking up. I wish I could look up, but I'm a little low-spirited today. What? Come on, a sweet old teddy bear like you, down in the dumps? Yeah. 
I'm Katie, by the way. Katie? Katie from Ketchikan? How did you know? Nancy Pearl mentioned you on the radio. She's intense. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you came here to be alone, so I'll just... Well, it's my job. Uh-huh. Go on. When I first got hired, everybody loved me. They had a party with cupcakes. What is it with Seattle and cupcakes? Are they afraid of full-size cakes? In Alaska, cupcakes are for children. Mm, but now... <laughs> now everybody is down on me. Like I was a screw-up. Now it's like I can't do anything right. They think I'm a goofball. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sure you're a great bike messenger. What? I mean, I saw your bike and I put two and two together. No, I'm the mayor. Oh! Did you vote for me? I was living in Alaska. I just moved. I had a dream last night that me and Jimmy Carter were raising kappa bears in Ballard. Hey! Cheer up! In Ketchikan, we had a much crazier mayors than you. There was one hand Stan, upskirt Charlie, oh, creepy Louise. Compared to them, you're amazing. You just gotta have confidence. Hmm. Thank you, Katie. I just wish I had a good solid issue for the next election. Maybe something related to transit. Oh, I have just the thing. It's something we have in Ketchikan that I think Seattle would love. Yeah? Spill it, it Katie. It's the roadkill list. Uh, excuse me? Oh, it's simple. When an animal gets hit by a car or truck, the trooper gets on the horn to whoever's at the top of the roadkill list, and that lucky devil comes down and gets the poor dead critter. I, uh, walk me through this, Katie. Well, it saves the city on the cost of hauling the carcass to the dump, and somebody gets a whole lot of free meat. So it's win-win. <laughs> I like win-win. Win-win. Although I sure wish Grandma Shirley would have looked up a real recipe for bear sausage instead of just winging it. The, the, the system really works? You bet. You can pretty much count on three or four caribou on prom night alone. Uh-huh. I might not use that point. But you gotta be a little careful, because a Great Dane and a deer can kind of... What about bikes? Bikes? If a bike hits an animal. Maybe a squirrel or a rabbit. Uh, but them's good eating, yeah? In a stew or casserole, sure. Hmm. Tell me more, Katie. Well, Your Honor. Hey, Marco. How's Katie doing? I sent her to Lincoln Park. Oh, who could that be? <gasps> Katie! Katie! Quick! Turn on the TV! This sounds important. This is Jim Foreman coming to you live from the mayor's office. <laughs> My fellow Seattleites, I am pleased to announce a new city program that increases our sustainability, reduces our carbon footprint, and addresses inner city hunger. <laughs> Starting Monday, we begin the new Wildlife Vehicle Interaction List. <laughs> Citizens can put their name on a roster and be eligible for this free range, organic, excellent source of protein. It's a win-win situation. We will even include healthy recipes and low emission cooking tips. Katie, <laughs> did you have something to do with this? Well, maybe I did. My cousin Katie from Next time on Cousin Katie. Katie, how goes the search for a boyfriend? Oh, Lena, it's tough out there. Yeah? Back home, it was easy. When you were in high school, the tallest boy would go steady with the tallest girl, and the second tallest boy would go steady with the second tallest girl, and so on. And then you get pregnant and get married, and five years later, you get a divorce and marry whoever lived next door. <laughs> that does sound simpler. Oh, did you try those websites I suggested? Yeah. Took me a while to figure out HWP did not mean has winning personality. <laughs> I was ready to throw in the towel 
Until last night. Oh, that's right. How did that date go? Well, we went for Mai Tais. Ooh, tropical. So, what do you think of the Seattle freeze? It's ridiculous. It makes it sound like Seattle is generating its own large weather systems. Poppycock. Our meteorological conditions are mostly formed over the ocean and then influenced by the topography, the Olympics, and Cascade Mountain ranges. If we're going to get a prolonged cold air mass, it'll arrive from the north. Cliff, stop! Sorry, Katie. <laughs> When I get nervous, I tend to jabber on about the weather. Nervous? <laughs> hey, hey, did you know that today's barometric pressure is hey, setting? Hey, Dr. Cliff Mass. At the risk of sounding like a big city girl, shut up and kiss me. <laughs> Did you really say that? Yeah, for once, I was the high-pressure system. I want to thank our special guests for that episode, Nancy Pearl and Cliff Matt. <laughs> Io credesse che mia riposta fosse a persona che mai tornasse al mondo. Questa fiamma staria senza più scosse. <ride> Ma per ciò che già mai di questo fondo non torno vivo alcun. <ride> si odo il vero senza tema d'infamia ti rispondo. Let us go then, you and I. When the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights and one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants and oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go. The talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the streets, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time. There will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create. And time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me. And time yet for a hundred indecisions. 
and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. <laughs> In the room, the women come and go. <laughs> the talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. <laughs> my morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. <laughs> Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I've known them all already. I've known them all. I've known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I've known them all already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl, and should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here is no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. And I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile? To have squeezed the universe into a ball? To roll it to some overwhelming question? To say... I am Lazarus, come from the dead. Come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all if one settling a pillow by her head should say. That is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets? after the novels and the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor and this and so much more. It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning towards the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. 
<laughs> no. I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant, Lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool. Deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous. Full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous. Almost, at times, the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottom of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaid singing each to each. <laughs> I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding on the waves combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. Oh, yeah. 
rushing. Yeah, I, I remember now. Who's rushing? <laughs> you ain't gonna. Who's rushing? You ain't gonna let me forget, are you? Well, listen here. Who's rushing? Heard the con man say he'd make me gold out of lead. Who's rushing? Heard the fairy tale princess say she'd weave me gold out of thread. Who's rushing? A lot of stuff I heard. A lot of stuff I read. Who's rushing? That's right. Where do they do it? Where angels fear the tread. Well, I don't know where I'm going, but what I've always said. Are you listening? Yeah. Get on out the way now, people. I got to get there before I'm dead. Twenty carat food. You're listening to Sandbox Radio, Fools Rush In, recorded in front of a live audience on April 29th, 2013. Mark your calendars for our next live show, The Naked Truth, coming up in Seattle at West of Lennon on July 29th. Until then, catch up on any shows you missed in iTunes or at thesandboxac.org. Now back to Fools Rush In and Markheim. Sandbox I'm a Markheim, a sort of angel, but not the sort with wings and a harp and a halo. Markheims are the black ops. We do things other angels can't or won't. Me, I'm a talker, subarchy, reverse curse. Upstairs pulled me out of retirement for a mission down in this soggy town. But when it was done, I didn't go back. I had questions, and the answers weren't up above in the fix. Now I'm walking neutral, half-fallen, in what we angels call the show. But I gotta watch my back, cause things can always get uglier. Previously on Markheim. I gotta get some relief. My hand is roasting. Meat, you've been blessed. Blessed? How you figure? You got a dose of the holy fire in that <sighs> hand. So long as it stays attached, you ain't never gonna die. I heard you cut off your glowing hand, but then they sewed it back on. Stank said it doesn't burn anymore. No, it still burns, but now it's so beautiful, crisp. I'm not worthy of this pain. But Veronica says no one deserves it more. Who's Veronica? Hello, Black Francis. I am Mark. I love you. He's, he's talking. So? This is a dream. Angels don't dream. Maybe things are changing. Change ain't always good. Never said it was. Run down this theory of yours and get back to me with anything you find. What about my neutrality? You're here at my pleasure, Markheim. Which it ain't exactly been, I gotta tell you, since you got here. Your rent on sitting neutral just went up. Information, payable to whomever the fuck I send to collect it. <laughs> there are too many goddamn angels down here. From now on, we see them, we smoke them. That's my new rule. You can pass it along. Things can always get uglier. And now, episode eight of Markheim by Paul Mullen. So Sam says, now I gotta pay rent in answers, and all I got is questions. Like who helped Didge sew his hand back on, and why? <laughs> Give it up! 
I want my dog back, Stank. Liv's dog, Mark, and fuck you. Is that Didge up there? He doesn't go by Didge anymore. That's some getup he's got on. That's his superhero gear. And that thing on his face? His mask. He made it from his hair. Charming. Uh, many of you do know, knew me by my street name, but I want to tell you today that, well, Didge is dead. This is someone new, someone stronger. In the Bible, the greatest hero was a man with long hair named Samson. He was invisible. Kid needs to read that book a bit more closely. In New York City, there was a serial call killer called Son of Sam. His avenging spirit lives on. Righteous! You're a killer! No, 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 no. I am worse than a killer. I am that which cannot be killed. I am Samson and Son of Sam. And Seattle doesn't need to be afraid of the dark or the light anymore. Son of Sam. He better watch who he summons. Why don't you shut the fuck up and listen to the man speak? What were you doing in Georgetown that night, Stank, when Didge cut off his hand? What? See this hand? It was cut off when I was lost in fear. You just happened to be there? I'm his friend, Mark. But now I'm found, and with this holy hand, I'm here to avenge all the shit smeared on the streets of Seattle. Seems weird to me, you being right there to call 911, make sure he got his hand sewn back on right away. It was damned lucky. Almost blessed, you might say. This hand is an immortal force the world must reckon with. Who you working for, Stank? Well, I'm between jobs, Mark. Upstairs? Downstairs? I try to stay away from stairs lately. What with those kids getting burned? I got rid of the burner. We will teach our twisted speech to the young believers. Righteous, yo! That's the Clash! I am the Clash, and you are the Clash, and the Clash is coming. We are all sons of Sam, but I am his firstborn. You a meat walker, Stank? A power? I've never known any other kind of angel willing to walk the meat but a lousy fix cop pow. You need help, Markheim. You're talking gibberish. Maybe, but you just called me Markheim. You always call me Mark. Oh. Oh. So what, Markheim? Things change. Change ain't always good. Never said it was, but it does seem inevitable. If you're meat walking, pow, Sam's gonna smoke you. I got that from his mouth. He's smoking everything that moves show side from the fix in Seattle. I'm just a juggalo. Yeah? Yeah. I'm just a juggalo, and everywhere I go, people know the part I'm playing. Yeah. <laughs> I'll crack your clockwork, Stank. Don't worry. And I'll get the dog back, too. Believe it. I'll tell you what I believe, Markheim. What's that? Things are getting uglier, don't you think? So Stank ain't what he seems, and Didge is playing dress-up and throwing Sam's name around like he doesn't know what that can bring. Someone's making a move, but who? Sam told me not to bother with the Angel of Truth. No way, Iofiel's involved, he said, and I tend to agree, but then that's all the more reason to reach out. She'll be safe, right? Safe or not, I need a lead. I head over to where I last caught a whiff of the fix. DJ! DJ! Hey! hey One more king! One more king! Hey! <laughs> hey, what can I get you, pal? Sar I off you. <laughs> what sort of fish is that? Not a fish. The Archangel of Truth. Your boss's boss, I figure. Take a hike, pal. We sell fish. I know. The Seattle throne works out of this fish stand. That makes at least one of you a pow. Get word to Sar Iofiel. There's a mark I'm looking for her in Seattle. I'm a pow, am I? Maybe. Hey, I'm a pow! One pound pow! One pound pow! Hey! Yeah! Oh. When the fish hits my face, I see the fix for an instant, full, blinding light and brutal bliss. And then someone's pulling me down some stairs. Dude, oh. dude, I am so sorry I was supposed to catch that, but Tommy threw it wide. Is Tommy the throne? Dude, what throne? How hard did you get hit? You okay? Let's get you down to Western, some fresh air and all. You're not an angel? Only my girlfriend thinks so, dude, and then only sometimes, right? Must have gotten my signals crossed. Big time, Markheim. Markheim? <laughs> ah! You need to not come back here. This ain't a game. This is the show. 
Mark Himes ain't had clearance in over a century. I'm walking neutral. Neutral? A fuck is neutral. Like the meat singer said, you gotta serve somebody. Tell Iofiel I need to parley. Fuck off to the fix, Mark Heim, or get your soft ass smoked to the crisp. Makes me know, never mind. I ain't no quill pushing cherub. I'm authorized to smoke on sight. So smoke me. <laughs> what? Smoke me to the crisp if it makes no never mind. What's with your face? It's. I don't glow. I've heard about how Mark. You don't know shit about Markheim's pows. You work wet like magicians work birthday parties. So show me some magic. I'm done with neutral. Smoke me. No. No? No way. Well, whatever you do, after you walk back up those stairs, don't you dare get word to Iofiel I'm looking for her. Got it? Got it. And for sure as hell, don't tell her Sam says hello. Sam? Now do not get the hell out of here and always bother me again. (laughs) I'm guardedly confident that that call will go through. Still, the pow was right. What the hell is neutral? One long ass kicking from fix to crisp. I needed some sleep. Which is nuts, of course, because as I've mentioned many times, angels don't sleep, and they sure as fuck don't dream. What the? Is that you, Black Francis? I know you're not real, but it's still good to see you, buddy. But please, don't say Sam's coming, because I got nothing to tell him, okay? He's got to leave me alone until I have a lead. Beg him if you have to. I need more time. You're losing it, Mark. Live! You're talking to Black Francis like he's gonna talk back. He did, the last time I saw him. Don't go crazy on me, man. Wait, you're really here. Uh, yeah. I'm not dreaming. If you are, then I am too. You're lucky I came, I'm mad at you. Why? You were supposed to look after Black Francis. I did, and then he got lost when I... Yeah? I had to take care of something. Stank found him. If I trusted Stank, I would have left him with Stank. Now I can't even trust you. It's been a long time, Liv. No one thought you were coming back. I told you I would. What happened? What do you mean? In Eugene, your stepfather. Oh, he's dead. Yeah? Yeah. I guess he was cleaning his shotgun and it went off in his face. Oh. I was the only one home when it happened. Oh. (laughs) So, my little sister's safe. Right. And what about you? What about me? You back for good? I ain't anywhere for good, Mark. You ought to know that. Got it. Take off that mask. You come in my store. I can't take it off, it's my hair. I know trust the man, I know see his face. You don't need to trust me, just sell me some juice. You know come in here, your face covered and no shirt on. What are you gonna do, shoot me? Why you say that? You threaten my friends all the time, the street kids? You're always showing them your gun. I got no gun. Sure you do, let's see it. You wanna see my gun? Sure. You no think I have gun? I know you have a gun, I just said so. There. See? Now get out of here. I ain't leaving until I buy this juice. You leave juice. You get out. Or what? You shoot me? I no shoot nobody. Well, call the cops because you just pulled a gun on me for trying to buy a juice. You get out of here. Or? I go like this. And bullet goes in chamber ready to shoot. Fabulous. Go. Let me see that. You no touch. Get away. Or what? Let me see your precious gun. Stay away. Here. Oh, so you do have it in you. Holy God. No, it's just me, Sam's son. Give me that. It's no use. You could do it all day. These bullets just melted me like butter. Yum. Now give me. You like guns so much? Why don't you eat it? What? Here, it's delicious. There, yummy, right? Go on, eat it. That's right, swallow it. You love your guns so much. Shit, shit. Veronica? Veronica! I, I was just feeding him his gun and, and any. He. Uh... Oh, Samson. What do I do? Oh, my baby child, it's all right. I'm here now, and I'll make it good. Just go. The cops are coming, and we don't want you facing them yet, do we? No. Not yet, my sweet darkling. You're Samson. Son of Sam, and your day will come. I love you. 
I know. You're the one thing worth loving. You just keep, keep believing in yourself, Samson, and Veronica will wipe your tears. There's nothing you can do that's wrong, and it's all about to get more beautiful. Is it? Oh, yes. You just keep believing. <laughs> Next time on Marka. Bez? Is that you? Long time no see. Yep. I see you made yourself at home on these steps. Sam send you? Yep. Says to tell you rent's due. I ain't got much. I've put out some feelers. It's gonna take some patience. Patience ain't exactly what Sam's known for. And feelers ain't exactly gonna cut it. Green Lake, huh? You're gonna get bored up here, you know that? That's good. <laughs> Board is safe, board is good. Mm, you say that now. I gotta keep my head down, Smiley, or I'm gonna wind up permanently bound in some bliss box or fried down to the crisp. Mm, none of that means anything to me. Stay away from him, Liv. Just trust me on this. Fuck you, Mark. You're not my dad. And you're sure as fuck not my stepdad. Well, thank heavens for that. Whatever. Didge would never bother me. Nobody bothers me. Why? Because you got Black Francis to protect you? Nah, BF's a baby. Wouldn't hurt a flea. It's because I got this. And what the hell is that? It's a butterfly knife. Pretty cool, huh? Very cool. So you're safe from butterflies, then? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Don't miss the next episode of Marka. Things are getting uglier, don't you think? <laughs> Sally, can you hear me? What's the matter with your phone? Can you hear me or not? They're here. They came yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the angels. Debbie sent them over. Well, she sent a chain mail, and it says you got to greet the angels, and they stay with you for five days, and then you get your wish. So I was going to send them to you next, if that's okay with you. The Angels by Emily Conbert. Okay, well, the way the ritual works, we light two white taper candles and three... What? What? I don't know. Um, votives might work, but why can't you just use tapers? I mean, it's just a trip to the mall, right? Ed? I'm not going to ask them, <laughs> the angels. I mean, you have time to go to the mall, of all people. I can't see them. How can I talk to them? Listen, um, Sally, let's have a shot of tequila. Yeah. We'll toast the angels. Angels, this is for you. Yeah. So, they stay with me for five days, and then my wish comes true. And what I'm asking you is, can they go to your place next? Because part of the deal is that you have to tell them where to go next. Well, because I have to have somewhere to send them. You can't just kick them out, you know, like any guests that come and they go. And, and I like to send them somewhere I trust, like to someone I love. I'm not gonna send him like Johnny or nothing. He'd put them in the garage with all those tools. I, I, I wanna send them over to you. I mean, you have nice sheets and nice things. You, you clean. Yeah. And, and Saul's out of town next week anyways, isn't he? Where's he going? Yeah? Hey, do you ever get paranoid that he picks up escorts on his trips? <laughs> well, I know they're work shindiggies, but does part of you wonder what he's doing those nights when he forgets to text you? I, I know he forgot to text you because you were crying about it last week. Well, oh, come on, because we both know Saul wants to be a man, and this is maybe one of the only ways he knows how, and not that you guys have money, you know, I, I, I'm just asking, do you get scared about, like, gaggles of strippers? 
I, I know. I hate the word gaggle. It makes me sick or shiver. But, but sometimes you have to use it. It's like you don't have a choice. Yeah. So, you're nervous about it? Oh, not nervous about it. Well, sorry. Am I nervous about my husband? <laughs> With escorts? Oh, that's silly. So anyways, you light two tapers. He would never do that. Or, or was it three votives? And I mean, make three wishes. And then at 7.30, he comes home. I mean, invite them in. <laughs> My wish for the angels? Well, honestly, I wish I were more fashionable. And I don't mean in terms of jar or cheekbone necessarily. I mean fashionable clothes. No, no, like even more than H&M. I mean Fifth Avenue, New York. Like even bigger, so big you wouldn't know the names of the companies. And more important, I wish I had fashionable friends. Bare-legged, haltered up friends, the sort that are tan. But anyways, I also wish I were older, maybe 60 or so, with white, slightly wavy hair and a gaggle of admirers around me that always think of me as wise, with beautiful things, a, a, a Dorothy Parker sort. Because the truth is that I hate myself in my fat thigh roots. I mean, I'm incredibly sad. Why don't I have glossy hair? And I have the sort of friends that are cool but think they're uncool and are really bothered about it, so they eat their cuticles or whatever, and they bleed all the time. <laughs> yes, of course, I consider you a friend, Sally. And they have contacts, but they should wear glasses to cover up their face, even though we tell each other, don't ever change. <laughs> the angels. I imagine them to think me beautiful. I mean, I assume they're on my side. They all piled into my house like a bunch of fools, like fools they just rushed in. But maybe they're not on my side. I don't know how I would know. I guess, I guess I'll know they're on my side if my wish comes true. What? I know. Well, well, that's the trouble with that particular wish. I won't know if it comes true until I'm 55 with wa wavy hair. And, and maybe the angels just think my wishes are dumb. Maybe they'll grant them, but they'll judge me. You know what? Fuck them. Fuck the angels. But... <laughs> But I don't really feel that way because, because each beautiful angel, well, so individual, so ideal and golden and pretty in their own way, each one, I, I bet each have pretty apple-like hearts. And the, the only problem with each angel is, well, each angel, they, have, they each have some sort of nail embedded in their hearts. One nail. So it hurts. And they know and I suspect that's how each one died, a nail in the heart. So, so maybe my wish is to be able to take a hammer and turn it inside out and rip, rip, rip the nail out of each angel's heart so they can relax again or just feel maybe a moment of relief. That wasn't my original wish, but maybe that's my wish now. Over being older with white hair, because what the hell is that? That will happen anyways. So, yeah, I mean, my original wish was to be fashionable with a gaggle of friends around me just sort of admiring me in my white suit and really thin watch that makes my wrist look small. But now... I think my wish is different. It's to take the nails out of their hearts. Oh, oh, Christ, Sally, is your son practicing piano again? Would you tell him to learn some other song besides St. Elmo's Fire? Every time I see him, he plays me St. Elmo's Fire. I wish you weren't my only friend so I could hear some other music, for Christ's sake. I also wish maybe to live in love forever, and I also wish for you to stop fucking my husband with your mind. But yeah, those are both big dreams, so yeah, I won't quit my day job. I'm sorry, Sally, that was wrong. Are you going to get the candles, Sally? Are, are, are you going to get the candles? Can, can you make one simple little trip to the mall? Oh my God, she hung up on me. Whatever, Sally. Don't leave me, angels. I don't want to send you on. I want you to stay. I know I'm a fool, but stay. Here. Here's a shot of tequila. Cheers.
Inside Portable 5 on March 25, 1980, was silent but aggressive. My own stomach churned as if I'd done something wrong, something horribly, horribly wrong, and was sure to be found out. Today was the day. Today, we, the fifth grade class at Schultz Elementary School, would be watching our very first sex education film strip. Please calm down and take your seats, everyone. That was a weird thing for Mr. Pierce, our teacher, to say because we were all sitting down, facing front and not saying a word. He must have been nervous, too. This day had been on its way for years, and we all knew it was coming. It was one of the countless advantages to being in the fifth grade. It was our last year at Schultz Elementary, and that meant a few goddamn things. You could be a crossing guard you got to go to an assembly and watch the middle school band play the theme song from M.A.S.H. And at some point during the year, you got to see at least partially naked girls on a film strip. <laughs> that was the rumor. Okay, everyone. These film strips were rumored to be so graphic, so hot that they actually had to separate the girls from the boys before spooling them into the film strip projector. The boys would watch what was referred to as the boys' film strip, and the girls would watch the girls' film strip. That was the rumor. I hoped silently to sweet Jesus God Almighty on his throne in the kingdom of heaven. That rumor was true. The young ladies will go next door to Portable 4 with Ms. Sharp and Miss Milas and watch the girls' film strip. <gasps> the collective sigh of relief swayed the projector screen back and forth like a sheet on a clothesline in a soft desert wind. And, everyone, after we watch our respective film strips, we will switch film strips and the girls will watch the boys' film strip, and the boys will watch the girls' film strip. For the first time in my life, I realized that my mouth was hanging open. <laughs> like most male contemporaries of mine, my mouth had been hanging open most of my life, and I'd never given it a second thought. But at that moment, 15 young boys simultaneously closed their mouths. The girls? They didn't flinch. They may have known something we did not, or they had a realization as well that it may now be a good idea to start pretending 
like they might know something we did not, but their plan would ultimately fail, wouldn't it? I was going to watch their film strip. Like a book left open on the sacred altar of a bubblegum lip smacker scented church, I would soon know all their secrets. Ladies, please stand up and form a single file line at the door, please. <laughs> Ms. Sharp lined the girls up and marched them out of Portable Five like some sort of twisted Orwellian future society where boys and girls aren't allowed to watch film strips together. <laughs> A slight chill ran up my spine. The last girl, Claudia Short, good God, I love you, Claudia Short, stopped at the door and turned her head back to the room looking at us as if to say, See you on the other side, boys. The next few years are going to be intense. <laughs> the door closed behind her for a moment and then reopened. As Jason Adams entered, followed by the rest of the males in his class, and behind them, Mr. Colin, the school principal, with a small red film canister in his hand. <laughs> Mr. Colin's presence in Portable 5 was telling not only had he left his office, which was rare enough, but he wasn't wearing his blue suit. Today he was wearing Wrangler jeans, a white turtleneck, and a brown corduroy sport jacket complete with dark green patches at the elbows. All of a sudden, Portable 5 had become the Playboy Mansion, and Hugh Hefner had just walked in. Oh my god, this was going to be a fine day. Hi guys. I'm just here to help answer any questions you might have. Every hand in the room shot up. Whoa. <laughs> Mr. Colin backed up a step. <laughs> okay, everyone. Mr. Pierce kept saying okay in that way that fifth grade teachers do when there is the slightest possibility that things may not actually be okay. 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 We will watch the boys' film strip, and then we will immediately watch the girls' film strip, and then, and only then, can you ask questions, okay? If there is any talking or laughing during the film strip, you will not be able to watch the second one. The air went out of the room. It was like the vacuum of space inside Portable 5. Okay, Mr. Connor, would you please dim the lights? Poor Richie Connor was so nervous. He knocked his desk over, standing up to get the lights. The film strip projector blazed to light. Shush! Mr. Colon pressed play on the cassette recorder. The deep, calm, velvet voice of film strip narration oozed from the tape player. Hello, and welcome to this Crown Educational Media presentation. When you hear this sound, advance the frame. <laughs> The obligatory film strip operation instructions seemed particularly drawn out. Knowing how we did, that we were only a few short dings away from what would basically be second base. <laughs> First frame, wide shot of a municipal building of some kind, perhaps a high school. You may notice that as you turn 11 and then 12, your body will be going through certain changes. Change to what? Well, apparently into a group of three greasy teenage boys. Their pimply mouths agape in mid-conversation. The center one sported a tremendous orange afro, the most hair I had ever seen in my life. Another had long, stringy blonde hair and was wearing a necklace of what looked like shells of some kind, but I couldn't really tell. And the third was in a tank top and jeans with American flags sewn onto the back pockets. American flags on 
pants? Who were these guys? I was totally ready to cop to the fact that my body was going to be going through certain changes, but not into these guys. Sorry. The time that young boys undergo the physical and emotional transformation into manhood is called adolescence, or more commonly, the teen years. Frame advance. An overhead shot of a high school hallway. There at least were girls in this shot, but something was very wrong. They were horrible, disfigured girls with long, straight hair, parts down the center of their white scalps wide enough to drive a Hot Wheel through. Some were wearing huge, round, clownish glasses and pants whose leg bottoms completely swallowed their feet in a swishing mass of fabric. I squinted, trying to comprehend... <gasps> I knew what these people were. I had seen them before, in pictures, taken long ago. These were hippies. What in the world would hippies know about sex? It is important that you are aware of the many changes your body is going through during this important time. Now, a diagram that was stranger to me than a whole hillside of hippies. I mean, it was obviously some dude's wiener, but it was unlike any wiener I'd ever seen. It was cut into a cross-section with green, orange, and blue tubes running up and down and over and under inside of it with green, orange, and blue arrows pointing to their respective tubes. Some of the most important changes have to do with the male genitals, or the penis. <laughs> Finally, a word I knew. <laughs> Perhaps this thing was going to turn around. Well, even John Holtzclaw, who had already abandoned the whole thing and begun working on his Dungeons and Dragons map, sat up at the word penis. And the next five frames were all of the same twisted diagram, but with different tubes highlighted. Urethra. Testis. Scrotum. Sperm. Sperm testis, you weak guy. What, what in the living hell is this guy talking about? What in the living hell is going on here? As the last ding dinged over more acne-covered love children eating lunch and putting books in lockers and playing sports in shorts that were just so, so entirely too short, all I really wanted was my money back. <laughs> Mr. Colon had put on his Bob Guccione outfit for this. <laughs> the lights came on. As if on cue, Miss Milas entered Portable 5 with the girls' film strip and cassette. Miss Milas was very pretty, and Richie may have been distracted by that, what with all the buildup and everything. Anyway, he knocked over his desk again, getting up to turn off the lights. <laughs> Boys. Hello, and welcome to this Crown Educational Media presentation. When you hear this sound, advance the frame. Obviously, the boys' film strip was only the warm-up. The goods still lie ahead. Wait a minute. These are the same hippies that marred the first frame of the last film strip. Hippie hallway. This is some kind of cruel practical joke, right? This, the girls' film strip, the one we weren't allowed to watch with girls in the room, was exactly the same as ours. Frame for frame, hippie for hippie. <laughs> the only difference was, in place of the penis diagram, was a cross-section of what I now know to be the lovely, mysterious, and poetic natural wonder that is the female reproductive system. But at the time, it looked to me like a bouquet of tulips smashed flat by a steamroller. <laughs> the same steamroller that had just smashed flat my heart. <laughs> Mr. Pierce, the liar, turned on the lights. Okay, gentlemen. Now, 
Mr. Almond, Mr. Colin, and myself will answer any questions you may have. Yeah, I've got some fucking questions, excuse my French. Where was the nudity we were promised? Why were there hippies just on our wall for a half hour? Why do the girls in the next room fill me with so much dread it is all I can do to ask one of them for an extra pencil? Why is the only thing I want in the whole freaking cruel and unusual world is for one of them to laugh, genuinely laugh at something I say? Why do I keep a stash of the old man's penthouse magazines the size of the Library of fucking Congress between my mattress and box spring? I sleep four feet off the floor, Mr. Pierce. Why? Tell me. Why? Doesn't anyone have any questions? <laughs> Come on, guys. It's cool. Jason Adams was the only one who raised his hand of all the people I would remember for the rest of my life. Yes. Jason? Mr. Colin looked nervous. But then again, so did Jason. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering, um, I was wondering how exactly you're supposed to know when you're sperming. And? The room fell apart. <laughs> Yeah, we were laughing, but the truth be told, not one of us knew how to tell if we were sperming either. And the only reason I have not gone back and sued the living bejesus out of the Marysville public school system for that day was Mr. Colin's answer to Jason's question about how he was exactly supposed to know if he was sperming. His neck flushed as Mr. Pierce rattled off OKs like artillery gunner. OK! The room fell silent. Mr. Colin said softly, Oh, believe me, you'll know. <laughs> that sentence sums up my entire experience with sexual education in the nine years I attended Marysville Public Schools. Oh, believe me, you'll know. <laughs> and you know what? I'll be good goddamned if he wasn't right. <laughs> Sean Bellier, Sarah Harlett, Tracy Highland, Charles Leggett, Rebecca Olson, Peter Dylan O'Connor, Annette Tatangi, Catherine Van Meter, Sean John Walsh, Richard Zyman. With the 
our special guest, Susan Corzat. Nancy Pearl. Cliff Mack. Our special guest, soprano, Megan Chenevin. And the Sandbox Radio Orchestra, Dan Tierney on drums. Rob Woodmer, accordion and clarinet. And on the keys, our composer, Jose Juicy Gonzalez. And I'm your host, Leslie Love. So, Catherine and Annette are bringing out some lyric cards. Now is the time in the show when we'd love for you to sing along. I think you've picked up the tune. Ready? Here we go! Washington on April 29, 2013. It was engineered by Christopher Stewart and mixed by Dave Pascal. Our stage manager was Colleen Nielsen, and our sound technician was Jordan Sell. You can follow Sandbox Radio on Twitter and subscribe to the podcast at the iTunes Store. Find out more about Sandbox Radio and the Sandbox Artist Collective. Send us an email and access our podcast archive at thesandboxac.org. Thanks for listening.